morning, everyone. Let's all stand up and greet each other. like lightning 
awesome darkness from the cover. But the baby cold that I can just get over. My name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I can't just get it over. My name is registered in hell. Yeah, my name is registered in hell. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause Chris rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. My this is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come to get the sons and daughters. Walk with blood and blood in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause Christ rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. This is my testimony. I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still come. Oh, I believe I'm not dead, you're not dying. Greater things are still come. Oh, I believe I'm not dead, you're not dying. Greater things are still come. Testimony from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. The Bible of life. This is my testimony from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus. Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Praise you again and again. 
worship. Thank you. Please be seated. Kids, you are dismissed to Children's Church, so go ahead and head on back there. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're well today. Are you doing okay? Yeah? Good, good, good. I, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to worship the Lord with you this morning. This is what God created us for, really, is that we would be worshipers of Him, and it's where we find our deepest sense of purpose. It's exalting the living God. So thank you for being here. We appreciate it a lot, and of course, uh, we want to minister to you and help you grow and take that next step in your relationship with God, and I hope you'll give us that opportunity. I'm Kerry Bauman. I'm the senior pastor here at River Ridge Church, and um, our, our heart's desire is that uh, you would know Jesus and then grow in a relationship with him so that you can, through your life and your words and your deeds, bring honor and glory to our Lord. So thank you for being here. Uh, I want to say to you, if you're new to the church, um, we have a couple of cards that are in the back. 
One of them is a smaller card, and as you leave, it'll be on your right. And if you are interested in talking with me and you want me to give you a phone call, fill out that card. I'll pick it up after the service. I'll give you a call this week and answer any questions you might have. If you want to get coffee or something, I'd be happy to do that as well. The larger card is for people who have attended here and said, you know, this is where God is calling us to worship. And uh, if you would fill that out, you only have to do it once, but if you've done it, uh, we will add that information into our database and make sure that you receive all the pertinent information regarding it. Well, we have uh, some exciting things uh, going on in the church, and hopefully they're all connected to our mission, which we say is to glorify God. The Bible says that everything we do should bring honor and glory to God, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. And that's what we want to do. And, and so we say we want to glorify God and advance his kingdom. That means that we want God's rule to, to be in our hearts in more fuller ways as we learn to submit to him in our lives. And then through us to bring other people to faith in Jesus Christ so that they too will bow their heads and hearts before him. And we say we're going to do this by loving others to Christ. And so in word and in deed, that's, that's our goal. We want to tell people about Jesus, and we want to show them our Jesus. And uh, we, we work hard at doing that. And hopefully, if you're visiting today, you'll experience Christ in the worship, but also in our church family. That's our heart's desire. Hey, uh, just to call your attention to a few things that uh, we've got going on in the church. We have our Guns and Grub coming up this Saturday. Today is the last day to sign up. I think we have about 55 people signed up. And uh, if you want to be a part of that, go online, riverridge.online, uh, register. Uh, it's a shooting event. We'll have a lot of fun. We'll be careful. Um, and anyone 12 or older can come as long as they're accompanied by an adult. So check that out. And uh, hopefully you'll want to be a part of it. We also have our annual baptism service that's coming up. And it's coming up uh, next Sunday in the evening at 5 o'clock. And um, today is the last day to sign up to be baptized. So if God's been speaking to you and uh, he's saying, listen, I want you to be baptized in my name. I want you to bear testimony of the work that I've been doing in your life. Then uh, today, after this service, stick around. I'm going to have a little class that we're going to teach in the elementary room right over there. And uh, I'll talk about the meaning of baptism from scripture and I'll prepare you for that event. But this is the last day that you can sign up to be baptized next Sunday. But we want all of you to come next Sunday. We'll have uh, a great celebration as uh, people share their testimonies in Christ and uh, some food afterwards, so make plans for that. Um, also, we want to uh, let you know that uh, our sixth annual River Ridge Golf Outing is coming in September on the 21st. And if you like to golf, um, uh, and you don't even have to be good at it, uh, you can just sign up. It's a scramble, so it's just we each hit a ball, walk up, find the best one to hit it. And uh, it's a lot of fun, though, and you'll have a lot of laughter and good times. And there's prizes for first, like third, sixth, eighth place teams, so you stand a chance at winning some uh, prize. Sign up online. Hey, this morning uh, we have an opportunity to hear something about a, a particular ministry that's taking place through our women ministry, and uh, Kim Pino is going to come with her husband, Jim, and uh, they're going to tell you about it. So, Kim, come on up. Oh. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, okay, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kim Pino, and this is my wonderful husband, Jim. He's assisting me by holding up one of the quilts that we get at Christmas together. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about So Be It. Um, we are a donation-based quilt ministry uh, designed to support our church community as well as outreach to our friends. Is that better? Sorry. <laughs> there I am. Um, to reach out to the ex extended community of our friends and family um, because we're all God's children and we're watching out for one another and prayerfully just supporting everyone through the trials that they're facing. We don't know what everybody's navigating. Um, what, what we do is once we receive our donations, the ladies come together and hand piece together the individual blocks. And we pray over the, 
the quilts as we tie them. And to me, what the quilt represents is how God takes, takes us in his loving arms and through our brokenness, he puts us back together with his perfect plan. So no two quilts are the same, just like none of us are the same. We all have different trials, different walks in life. But isn't that just like God to put it together in a beautiful way? And we don't even know where it's going. But trust, he knows what you need, and he will take care of you and provide. So if there's someone on your heart that you would like to request a quilt for, there is a link on our website, or you can reach out to me directly. Um, I would get that information to our team, and we would uh, get the quilt made. We do do this anonymously, so uh, you, if you want to be known you were the person requesting, that's fine. If not, we won't let them know, and we don't, you know, we don't make anybody stand out. We do this quietly, humbly. So I just want to end with uh, a verse that, was, that came to me this morning. It's in Psalm 61, 2, uh, and it goes, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. On that note, I ask that God blesses you all richly. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I, I said they're beautiful quilts, and I said, boy, it'd be cool to be buried in one of those. And so they rushed off this week and made one and gave it to Lori. So I don't know if they're aware of something that's happening, and I don't know about it. But uh, thanks, Kim. Thanks, Jim. We appreciate it a lot. Hey, uh, this morning, I want to pray for us as a church. And last night, I was praying for us. I, you know, maybe like a lot of you, as you get older, I don't sleep as well at night. And uh, so I was up and I thought, well, Lord, you want to say something to me? And so I was just praying about different stuff and, and asking God to really honor himself in our worship this morning. So let's bow our heads and pray about that together. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, first of all, we recognize that when we use words like awesome and great, that really there is only one who truly is awesome and great, and that's you. And this morning, we come before you with our heads and our hearts bowed before you, and we express our allegiance to you, that we want to live for you, that we want to do things that will uh, point people towards you, and we want to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people can, can be a part of your family, the family of God. You say, as, as many as received Jesus to those who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. And we want everybody to know you. We want everybody to be a child of yours, Heavenly Father. So we pray to that end. And uh, we are so grateful uh, for the opportunity to be together this morning. And we do pray that every part of this worship service whether it's the singing, the announcements, the teaching from your word, whatever it is, the offerings, that truly it would be pleasing to you. And uh, Lord, that you would receive it as an act of worship. Uh, this morning, Lord, we want to pray for our church family. You say love one another. In fact, you say it 10 times in the New Testament. And that's what we want to be. We want to be about loving each other. And I thank you that so many here at River Ridge take that seriously. And they really do want to love others here in our church family. And I pray that people would come and experience that. If they're coming for the first time, I pray that they would feel welcome here and cared for. And Lord, if they've been a part of this church family from the outset of the church, I pray that they too would feel cared for and loved. And Lord, as Kim shared about the So Be It ministry, we just want our church family to know that every person here matters, that every person counts for the kingdom. And so uh, we pray that as they try to, to minister and come alongside of people with the gift of a quilt, we would, we would just use our gifts and talents to do the same thing, to bear each other's burdens, to help each other to grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we, we love our community. We want to pray for our family, our, our friends, our neighbors, and ask, Lord, that you would help us to visibly manifest your love to them uh, in, in deeds, in good deeds. You say to do good to everyone, and that's what we want to do, especially to those of the household of faith. So please, Lord, let them look at us and see you. And then, Lord, create in them a desire to know you. So we ask that 
through our testimony that you would save people from the penalty of sin and bring them into the kingdom of your beloved son. Thanks for this time this morning, Lord. We truly pray that you'll be honored by it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. team. Let's, let's just pray for a second. Heavenly Father, I just uh, yield myself to you, and I just pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would speak not only to my own heart from your word, but also to every one of us who is here. And help us to kind of unpack the wisdom of Proverbs and to be able to bring it to our lives to bear in a way that ultimately, Lord, will, will make us like Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, I'm going to read uh, three separate little passages from Proverbs for you this morning. 
So I'm going to read Proverbs 2, 7, and 8, Proverbs 10, 9, and Proverbs 11, 3. And here's what they say, Proverbs 2, 7, and 8. God stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Proverbs 10, 9. He, he who walks in integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will be found out. In Proverbs 11, verse 3, the integrity of the upright will guard them, guide them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. Please be seated. So the marathon is one of the most strenuous athletic events in all of sports. And of course, the Boston Marathon is maybe the most famous of all the races, and it attracts the best runners in the world. And the winner is automatically placed among the great athletes of our time. A, a few years ago, Rosie Ruiz was the first woman to cross the finish line. She had the laurel wreath placed on her head in a blaze of lights and cheering. Uh, she was a completely unknown in the world of running. It was really an incredible feat. Her, her first race was a victory in the prestigious Boston Marathon. But then someone noticed her legs, loose flesh, cellulite, and questions were asked. No one had actually seen her along the 26.2 mile course, and then the truth came out. She had jumped into the race during the last mile. There was immediate and widespread interest in Rosie. Uh, why would she do that? Uh, why would she do that when it was certain that she would be discovered? Uh, athletic performance can't be faked, as you know. Uh, the amazing thing is, is that even though she was confronted with cheating, she never admitted her fraud. She repeatedly said that she would run another marathon to validate her ability. She never did. People interviewed her, searching for a clue to her personality, uh, and eventually she was analyzed as a sociopath. Uh, she lied convincingly and naturally with no sense of conscience, no sense of right and wrong, acceptable and unacceptable behavior. In, in reading about Rosie, uh, we perhaps think of some people we know in the church who give the impression that they follow Christ because they want to get in on the end of the race, but their reality is something very different. They appear in church on Sundays and they're wreathed in smiles entering into the celebration, but there is no personal life that leads up to it or out from it. Certainly they can be convincing and plausible, but in the end, it's, it's a grand deception. They believe only when it suits them. They seldom pray and rarely open their Bibles. If, if the proper term for someone like Rosie is a sociopath, then we might say that the proper term for these church fakers would be a religiopath. Someone who is good at deceiving others, but when you get right down to it, has never actually entered the race that God has set before us. This morning, as we uh, continue in the second message in our series called Words of Wisdom for a, for a Whacked Out Crazy World, I want to talk about an important character quality that seems to be the antithesis of what Rosie demonstrated. It's mentioned often in Proverbs, and I'm referring to the character quality of integrity. The dictionary defines it as the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. In Proverbs, the word that's used there describes something or someone who is whole, complete, finished. As it pertains to people, uh, it refers to those who are wholeheartedly committed to a moral and ethical life in obedience to God. Believers with integrity uh, do not fake anything. Uh, here are some verses that talk about integrity that I just want to read to you. Proverbs 2.21 says, For the upright will live in the land, 
and the blameless, that's the actual word for integrity in the Hebrew, will remain in it. Proverbs 10, 29, the way of the Lord is a stronghold to the upright, again, the word integrity, but ruin to the workers of iniquity. Proverbs 13, 6, righteousness guards the one whose way is blameless, but wickedness subverts the sinner. Proverbs 19, 1, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than he who is perverse in speech and is a fool. Proverbs 20, verse 7, a righteous man who walks in his integrity well, how blessed are his sons after him. In Proverbs 28, 18, he who walks blamelessly will be delivered, but he who is crooked will fall all at once. Well, I thought it'd be good since we're into Proverbs and looking at the wisdom that God gave to Solomon that is meant for every one of us, that we would look at this word integrity and try to discover the marks of integrity in the life of a person who takes God seriously. And specifically, I want to look at a person from the Old Testament. His name was Daniel. As you probably know, he was a prophet of Israel. He has a book named after him in the Old Testament. Uh, he may well have been a descendant of one of Israel's greatest kings, Hezekiah, because uh, God said to Hezekiah in 2 Kings, he said, some of your descendants are going to be exiled into Babylon. And when you read Daniel in Daniel chapter 1, it, it states that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, when the Jews were exiled there, took some people of royal descent from Israel and brought them into his court to be of his service, and Daniel was one of them. Uh, so along with many of the Jews, here's Daniel, he's a young man, He's exiled to Babylon. The date is about 586 B.C. And just as the prophet Jeremiah had told that it would happen uh, to the people of Judah for their sin and unrepentance. So imagine what it must have been like for him. Uh, one moment he's in the country that he loves. He's with people that he loves. And the next, he finds himself in a faraway land and he doesn't hardly know anyone and has no idea what's going to become of him. Uh, still, even in these really difficult circumstances, Daniel was a young man who maintained his integrity. He maintained his godly character. He held on to it. And there's some lessons we can learn from his life. And this morning, I just want to share a few of those lessons. And hopefully, uh, they'll help you as you think through your own personal integrity before God. And so let's look at some of those together. And the first one is this, that like Daniel, people of integrity live their convictions. So we read in Daniel chapter 1 that he was selected, as I said, to serve in Nebuchadnezzar's court, along with several other young Hebrews of royal descent. These young men were described as being without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed and quick to understand. Now, remember, they came from royal descent, so there was a, an advantage to growing up in Israel and being of royal descent because you were well-fed, so they tended to be healthy, and you were well-educated so that they uh, showed aptitude in every kind of learning. And, and Nebuchadnezzar recognized that, and so he set some of these young men aside, and he appointed a man named Ashpenaz to be uh, over them and to, to have responsibility for teaching them the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans, just another name for the Babylonians. And they were expected uh, to be in kind of a, a three-year course, and sort of like what we might say is college today. And they were to eat from the king's table, which meant they were to eat the same food as the king. Now, it turns out this was a problem for Daniel and a problem for three of his friends. The uh, Bible says they did not wish to defile themselves. The word defile means to pollute or desecrate themselves. And we don't know necessarily why they couldn't eat this food. We don't know if it was uh, maybe came from pigs. We don't know. Uh, someone suggested, and I think there's some merit to this, that if they would have eaten from the king's table, they would have uh, accepted Nebuchadnezzar's friendship and patronage 
And certainly, they didn't see Nebuchadnezzar as either a friend or a patron. They saw him as an enemy. And so as a young man who was wholeheartedly committed to God, Daniel did something that took some courage. He decided to ask Ashpenaz to permit them to eat only vegetables and drink only water for 10 days. And then he he could visibly judge them and see if they appeared healthier than the other youths who were brought in to be trained. Now, Ashpenaz was reticent, Scripture says, to do this, because he said, well, if you turn out to be in worse shape, and Nebuchadnezzar finds out, he may have my head for this. But the Scriptures say that God caused him to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, and he agreed to the test. Ten days later, the verge was in, and Daniel and his friends looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other youths who ate from the king's table. So Ashpenaz continued to give them only vegetables and water until the three years of training were complete. So how did it turn out for these young Hebrews? Well, it says in verse 17 of Daniel 1, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And at the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So it it turned out pretty well for Daniel. I have to tell you that I'm convinced that had Ashpenaz refused Daniel's request and demanded that he eat from the king's table, and Daniel had, had to take his stand based on his own personal integrity before God, that I believe he still would not have eaten from the king's table. Uh, He had the kind of faith in God that if that came to that place, he had the moral backbone to do what he believed was right and trust the Lord with the result. It does say in Scripture in Proverbs 2, 7 and 8 that this is kind of what happens with a person of strong moral character. It says, God stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield, God is a shield, a protector to those who walk in integrity guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of of his uh, saints. So the the writer of Proverbs says uh, that, that Daniel, being wholeheartedly devoted to God, was not afraid of what would happen to him had he not eaten from the king's table and not have been blessed because it was a conviction that he simply was not going to ignore. He was going to live out his convictions. That's what people of integrity do. They, they have convictions that have come from God, and they, they realize that they're important, and they're not going to compromise those convictions. There, there's a second thing that people of integrity uh, experience, and that is they receive God's favor. Later in the book of Daniel, we discover that the Babylonians were conquered literally overnight by the Medes and the Persians, and another man named Darius came into power, and one of his first orders of business was to to take and find some capable men who could lead his empire from among those who were in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And it says this, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. I don't know exactly what these positions entailed, but let's imagine that they were maybe what we might call mayors today of large cities or governors. And these men were to be throughout the whole kingdom. And then over them were three presidents of whom Daniel was one and to whom these satraps would give an account so the king might not suffer loss. And then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps because there was an excellent spirit in him. And so the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Daniel stood out. He stood out among all the others because of his character, because of his integrity. 
And so Darius made a good choice. He said, you know, above all of them, I can trust him the most. And I'm about to place him in a position kind of like what we might call vice president today, second only to Darius himself, because he knew that he could be trusted to guard his interests. And Daniel had, had done that. Daniel had learned in his life um, that if he was a man of integrity, that he had a, a very high priority, and that was by virtue of doing what was right and avoiding what was wrong, that he would give God glory. So it wasn't so much about blessing Darius as it was about his relationship with God and wanting to give him glory. You, you may remember the story in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar is still in power over Babylon. He has a dream one night, and it really troubles him. So he, he calls in all of his wise men and magicians and, magicians and conjurers, and he says, I had a really bad dream. It, it troubled me, and I want you to tell me the interpretation of the dream. But in order that I might be able to trust your interpretation, you have to tell me the dream first. And they all look at him and go, what you're asking is impossible. No one can do that but the gods. There's not a man on earth who could pull that off. Now Nebuchadnezzar knows that maybe they're not as wise as they profess to be. And so he orders for all of his wise men to be eliminated. Daniel was one of those wise men. And so as Daniel's out doing his thing, someone comes to him and is maybe preparing to, to kill him. But Daniel goes, whoa, 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 what's, what's going on? And, and he tells him, and he says, here, do me a favor. Go back to Nebuchadnezzar. Give me a little bit of time and, and I'll give him the interpretation. I'll give him the dream and its interpretation. And the Bible says that, that Daniel then took some serious time to pray to God. And he asked the Lord to reveal uh, the dream and then to reveal the interpretation. And, and so finally God gave him that. He came in to see Nebuchadnezzar and here's what it says. Uh, Daniel says, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can ex explain to the king the mystery that he has asked about, but there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. So what can we learn from this? Well, it seems like God's blessing rests on believers who possess integrity. Certainly, the book of Proverbs agrees. Here's what it says. Proverbs eleven twenty. it says, Those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. That word delight can be, and in other places it is, translated as favor. The point being is that God bestows favor on people who are are blameless in their ways, who are people of integrity. You find that in many different places in the Old Testament. The point is, is that when we as believers live out our convictions, we can anticipate in many cases the Lord's blessing. Uh, I, I read this story some time ago about a man named Donald Wills Douglas. Uh, he was the founder and president of Douglas Aircraft, he founded it in 1921, and he was the president until 1967. Uh, he was raised by his parents to honor Christian virtues, uh, none of which was more important to him than his integrity. In the 1950s, his company was competing with Boeing Airlines to win a contract with Eastern Airlines to build their first big jets. So after receiving the proposals from both Boeing and Douglas, Eddie Rickenbacker, who was the head of Eastern Airlines, compared the two, and he noticed that there were some differences, so he called in Donald Douglas. And he said, I, I've looked at both proposals, and I realized that your proposal was very similar to theirs, with one exception, and that is in the, in the cabin noise level. And what I want to know from you is, is there any way that you can safely reduce the amount of noise in the cabin? And so Donald Douglas went back with his engineers and they took a good look at it and tried to figure it out. But eventually Douglas had to come back and he had to say to Mr. Rickenbacker, uh, we can't do it. 
We, we, cannot, we cannot tell you that. Rickenbacker looked at him and said, I, I know you can't. I just wanted to see if you would be honest. Congratulations, you just got yourself a contract for $135 million. Now, today, you think that's not very much. By the time some of you retire, that might be what you need to have in your retirement account just to make it. But in the 1950s, the equivalent in U.S. dollars today is $1.75 billion. But it makes sense. If you're going to give that kind of a contract to somebody, it better be somebody that you trust. And so with integrity comes God's favor. It requires that we live our convictions, but it often means that we experience God's favor. There is an, another thing you need to know, and that is people of integrity take some risks. Proverbs 20, 19, 29, 19, or 10 says, Bloodthirsty men hate one who is blameless, and they seek the life of the upright, those with integrity. That's Daniel's story. If you read on in Daniel chapter 6, you realize that there were a lot of people who were jealous of his success, and they wanted him out of the picture. So the Bible says they sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Imagine that. Someone did a deep dive investigation into his service for the king and they came up empty handed. I suspect if anyone took similar action today against most modern day politicians, uh, it might be a little different. And they might come up with many things that they would call into question, but they couldn't find it in Daniel. And so eventually they decided that the only way to sort of trip up Daniel and to get him out of the picture was to find a ground of complaint against him in connection with the law of his God. They, they now realized that when it came to his faith, he had integrity. He was never going to compromise it. And so this is the plan they came up with. They appealed to Darius to make a law declaring that everyone should pray to Darius for 30 days, and anyone who didn't would be cast into the lion's den. It was an appeal to Darius' pride, and it was very successful. And so Daniel's enemies saw this as the way to get rid of this pain in the rear-end Jew because they knew he would never do such a thing. And so they, they enacted the law, or Darius enacted the law, and then they stood and waited and watched. And the Bible says that Daniel did what he always did. He went to his home, he opened the windows to face Jerusalem, and he prayed, as he did, three times a day. And there they were, watching and waiting, and when they saw him, they snatched up Daniel, brought him back to Darius, and this is what they said, O oh, king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days, except to you, O oh, king, should be cast into the little den of lions? And the king said, Yeah. The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. And then they answered the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but he continues to make his petitions three times a day. Read the story in Daniel chapter 6, and this news greatly distressed Darius. I mean, he thought so much of Daniel, knew he was a trusted leader, that he intended to put him second in command only to himself. And so scripture says he actually spent a considerable amount of time trying to figure out how to get Daniel out of this mess. But in the end, the law that he had enacted couldn't be repealed for anyone. And so Daniel was cast into the lion's den. What had Daniel done wrong? Nothing as far as the law of his God was concerned. He had just done the right thing. He was wholehearted about his commitment to God. So listen to me, I'm going to tell you something. If you decide that you want the character 
of God in your life. If you want to be a person of integrity, wholly committed to the Lord, there's going to be some risks. Not everyone is going to be excited about that. In fact, there may be times when you suffer for it. I used to work for an alarm company and I, I was getting ready to make a big sale. I was a salesman and, uh, with a company and, and it would have been a, a nice commission for me and a good sell for the company. And, and uh, so I, I had them all set to sign the contract when the guy said to me, I just have one question for you. Um, can they install this system next Monday? It has to be in on Monday. And I said, uh, well, I'll go back and ask and I'll give you a call. So I went back to the office and I said, he's ready to sign. It'd be a good job. I just have to know, can we have it in by Monday? So they said, talk to install. And I did. And install said, no, we cannot put it in on Monday. We already have jobs scheduled. And so I went to my sales manager and I said, uh, they, they can't do it on Monday. And he looked at me and he said, that's okay. Just tell them they can and get them to sign the contract. Once they sign that contract, it's ironclad. They cannot get out of it. And then you can call them on Monday and say, oh, I'm so sorry. They were all set for you. And then it didn't work out. It's going to have to be a later day this week. And I had a choice to make. And I looked at my sales manager and I said, I can't. And he said, why not? You're going to get a great commission out of this. I said, I just can't. It would be a lie. I would be deceiving this customer. He said, so what? You're going to, it's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit the company. Just tell them. And I said, I can't. I didn't know what would happen to me as a result. I just knew that if I, if I did what he was asking, it would violate my integrity as a person. And I couldn't do it. And there's going to be times when you're going to be asked to violate your own personal sense of integrity before the Lord, to compromise right and wrong. Like Daniel, you're going to have to decide, do I stand for what's right or do I stand for what's wrong? Now, there's one more thing you need to hear about Daniel. And it applies to us as well. And like Daniel people of integrity ultimately inherit good. So if you're familiar with the story, you know how it all plays out. Daniel is cast into the lion's den the following morning, until the following morning. Darius doesn't sleep at all that night. He's pacing around in his palace, waiting in that break of dawn. He runs out towards the lion's den, and this is the part I love, and he wants to see if Daniel's still alive. And he calls out, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? What a great statement to make about someone. Has your God whom you serve continually saved you from the lions? And that's when Daniel calls out from inside the lions den and says, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the lions' mouths and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and before you. Well, king, I've done no harm. And the king was exceedingly glad and he commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. Now, certainly that was a good outcome for Daniel. But that wasn't the best part. And neither what, was, what happened next, well, I don't believe that was even a good part for Daniel because Darius, being a pagan king, then realized what had taken place. And so he, he said to those who were with him, take the people who set this trap for Daniel, throw them, their wives, and their children into the lion's den. They were thrown into the lion's den, and it was said that they could hear the lions crushing the bones of those people. And I don't think that brought joy to Daniel at all. The Bible says that God never rejoices in the death of his wicked, and I, or the death of the wicked, and I don't think that Daniel was rejoicing in that. It's what happened next that brought Daniel joy that was good. Darius then decreed that in all his royal dominion, people were to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. He said, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. 
He delivers and he rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. And he who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. When you're a believer, that outcome is about as good as it gets. Reminds me of what it says in Proverbs 28.10. Whoever misleads the upright into an evil way will fall into his own pit, or we could say lion's den, but the blameless will have a goodly inheritance. They will inherit good. Now, to be fair, it doesn't always play out this way. Sometimes people only experience the goodness of God after they have suffered and maybe even departed this life and entered into eternity. But it pays to remember that the upright have a goodly inheritance, either in this age or the age to come. So people of integrity live their convictions, they receive God's favor, they take some risks, and they inherit good. So how do you become a person of integrity like Daniel? I, th I think there's a couple things that have to take place. First, you have to know the difference between right and wrong. And where do we get that? We get it from the Bible. I, the scripture says of itself in 2 Timothy 3, that all scripture is God-breathed, inspired by God, and profitable for teaching what is right, correcting what is not right, or rebuking what is not right, correcting which is how to get right, and training in righteousness, which is how to stay right. If you want to know right from wrong, you have to be in the Bible. You have to open up the scriptures. I issued this challenge last week. I'll say it again. While we're studying Proverbs together, let me strongly encourage you, get your Bible, open it up, and every day read a chapter of Proverbs. There's 31 chapters. If you read one a day in a month, you will read them all. And if you continue to do that, God will take the wisdom of Proverbs and give it to you, and it will serve you well. So you have, you have to know right and wrong. Then you have to want to walk blamelessly. Uh, so just a couple of thoughts. How do we do that? Because we draw near to God. The closer we get to God, the more we want to be like him. And if you want to walk blamelessly, the Bible says, be holy as I am holy. Draw near to God. And secondly, that means you've got to do some self-examination. You've got to take a look at what's inside. Lamentations 3, let us examine our ways and test them. I have to do this all the time. Lord, I... I think I have a pure motive here, but I'm inviting you to look at it. And if, if there's some self-centeredness in this, if I'm, if I'm doing or saying the wrong thing, then please reveal that to me because I, I want to do your will. I want to do what's right. It's important. When Desiree Kelly woke at 5 a.m. one morning, she knew something was off. She felt a very unsettling, fluttering sensation in her right ear. Initially, she dismissed it, thinking it was just the comforter on her bed, but she sought out medical attention later when her fiancé encouraged her to. Sitting in the clinic's waiting room, Kelly felt that mysterious movement again. This time, it was accompanied by pain in her eardrum. By this point, she was beginning to think it was a buildup of earwax. The nurse, however, made a very startling revelation. There was something in her ear, and it was moving. The nurse treated Kelly's ear by irrigating it with water, which prompted a black object to fall onto her sweater. To her horror, it was a live spider about the size of a nickel. Unfortunately, there was no, or fortunately, there was no damage to her eardrum and no medication was required to prevent any infection. But despite the reassurance that her ear was free of spider remnants or eggs, that incident left a profound impact upon Kelly. Every night since, she has worn earplugs to bed, unable to shake the uneasy feeling and that she had when she saw the spider crawling out of her ear. Listen, if you want to know what's in your ear, Go seek out a medical professional. If you want to know what's in your heart, 
there's another place to go. And that's to the Lord. And he'll reveal it to you. If you want to know, go to him. Draw near to him. And let him show you what needs to be dealt with to be a person of integrity. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you this morning for your word. Uh, we think about Daniel and really what a remarkable character he had. Next to the, the Lord Jesus, he may have exemplified this character quality more than anyone else in all of scripture, and we just praise you for that. And we read in Proverbs that integrity matters a great deal to you. So we pray that you will help us to possess the same kind of commitment to you that we're willing to live out our convictions, that we're willing to trust you, that we're willing to see your hand at work in our lives. And even, Lord, when it looks like it's going to turn out for um, uh, potentially our detriment, we, we pray that we will continue to do the right thing and ultimately that we will inherit good. Help us, Lord, to be people of integrity. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand as we close. All throughout history, your faithfulness is born beside me. When the storm makes way for spring In every season From where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see the promises Fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. Feel me come and feel me. You lead my heart to victory. my strength and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see the promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over
If you're going to the baptism class, we're going to meet immediately after the service in the a room over here on the other side of the wall to my left. And uh, we'll take about 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, so just meet me over there. And uh, if you need prayer in your life, uh, we're here. And we want to pray for you because we love you. We really do. And we care about you and want God's blessing in your life. Now please receive the benediction. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, may equip you with everything good for doing his will. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace and serve the Lord.